Wow. Here we are. I'm really excited to um, introduce this. I don't like to call it an interview because interviews make me nervous. And I think it makes the person nervous. I like to call it a conversation, you know, and um, first of all, this is Gilbert Carillo, which you probably many of you are like, who's that? You will know in a second. Um, there was a crazy serial killer a few decades ago by the name of Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. And I was watching this Netflix show called The Night Stalker. It was like a short miniseries, uh, like a documentary. And I saw your face, Gil, and I was blown away because you were one of two of the main detectives on this case. You know, and I'm like, man, I got to meet this guy. I got to talk to this guy. And, and be before, Gil, I ask you any questions or anything, I want to just let you know that even as I'm 49 years old, and even as a 49-year-old, I got so excited when I saw a Chicano detective in is probably one of the most notorious serial killer cases in United States history. And I was just so blown away and I was so proud. It was weird because I don't know you. This is the first time I'm actually talking with you, but I felt like a, a part of me, you know, a part of me won that case. And I don't know, if that, I don't know if that's a weird thing or not, because I think it has a lot to do with being raised with not that many um, people to look up to, you know, and I'm just like, I got to meet this man. So I want to welcome you to our YouTube channel, Gil. Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. And it's my pleasure to be with you. Yeah. So I, I know the first time we talk real quick, and I don't want to talk a whole bunch. I, I want you to talk, you know, but I want to say this is that I remember at first when I, and I asked you, you said, um, well, um, I noticed you're a pastor and I don't want to talk religion. I don't want to talk those things. I said, no, 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 no. Here's the thing. I said, I know I'm a pastor, <laughs> you know, and you know, but the very fact that you are a Chicano that became a detective in a major city in the United States, that is fascinating enough. Because you already stated in the Netflix, you stated in the very first episode where your beliefs were and all that. You put that out there right away. You know, so I, I just find it fascinating if, if you could just share a little bit of, first of all, who is Richard Ramirez for those of people that don't know, if we could do a little bit, just in case people don't know, cause you know, these young people, man, <laughs> a lot of the young people have no idea, you know, is, is there anything you can share about that first before we kind of go into what got you into, uh, to be a homicide detective? Well, Richard Ramirez was at the time of his arrest was a 25 year old drifter from El Paso, Texas, uh, raised in El Paso, uh, mother, father, uh, he had, two, maybe three brothers, and he had a sister, and uh, got in trouble early, didn't finish school, uh, got caught doing uh, break-ins, he was working at a hotel, and ended up just drifting on over to uh, LA, got involved in drugs, got hooked up with some people, then, uh, you know, something that I learned at a school, at a college, uh, sex is uh, to the individual, whatever makes him feel good. So Rich was a sexual deviant and that led him to start uh, kidnapping, uh, what the public really didn't know until this documentary came out uh, that much as he was kidnapping kids, sexually assaulting them, both boys and girls, uh, releasing them. And then he started sexually assaulting women. But he was doing this by breaking into residences throughout Los Angeles County. And if there was a husband in the way, he killed the husband to eliminate the obstacle between him and his uh, subject of lust. And then he would go ahead and sexually assault the women. And essentially, if they acquiesced, they lived. If they fought, he's, they met their untimely death. And he went to prison. On uh, June 7th, 2013, he died of natural causes while in prison, awaiting a death sentence. Wow. Um, 
You said something that I never heard before. You said sex is what? Sex is whatever makes you feel good. So you have to imagine that there are people that get sexual gratification. You've heard everybody, anybody who watches the news at all, here's a pyromaniacs that start fires. Mm -hmm. That is a sexual act. That's That turns the guy on. That is sex to him. Really? Somebody that would, uh, pedophilia, because he goes after little girls or after little boys, uh, that is a sexual act. That is sexual deviancy. Uh, somebody that likes to see someone, just the fear in someone's face, they derive sexual gratification over scaring the bejesus out of somebody. I noticed you, I noticed you said that about Richard Ramirez, that he liked to, the, 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 the look in their eyes or something like that? Yes, and, and, and this stuff, uh, this is not something that everybody learns about every day in school or growing up because sexual deviates are very much to themselves. They're introverted in that, that way. This is something that I picked up from the great professor, Dr. Robert Morneau, retired FBI agent. I took two semesters at uh, Cal State LA, advanced criminal investigation pertaining to sex crimes. And he gave me the knowledge it was a great moment for me when I got to go back after the case was solved to go back and thank him personally because he gave me the knowledge to work this case. Always advising the students that any reasonable and prudent sex crime investigator would note these things where other cops wouldn't. And it was very true. Wow. You know, man, so that led me to a couple of questions. That's fascinating. You know, like, um, so I imagine then there's a lot I'm sure he wasn't the only serial killer or killer. I mean, you were a detective for how many years? I worked homicide bureau for a total of uh, 26 years. I worked 21, wow. 21 as a, an investigator and eventually five years, my last five years on the department, I retired as a lieutenant where I had 14 homicide cops working for me. Wow. So that means a lot of root then comes back to, to that very thing you're talking about. That's interesting. You know, when, when somebody is, is doing something for the gratification of something, um, that, that's, a, that's fascinating, actually. That's interesting, you know? And um, so, you know, I was watching the show. I was watching it again, the Netflix uh, series. And were you, how, how were you approached for that? Were you, were you hesitant or how did that happen? <clears throat> Realities are, it was just another murder. We were that was our job. We worked murders. I was on call. Uh, they called me at 1040 at night, uh, March 17th, 1985, on a Sunday, uh, to go investigate the untimely death of Dale Okazaki, yeah. wounding of her roommate, uh, Maria Hernandez. It was just, just another homicide team going out to a routine mundane murder. Uh, then, as things started to collect and I started seeing things, then I started taking note of other homicide invest investigations that were going on, other child abductions that had been going on in the area. And then you just keep rolling along and then you get another murder and you match it to one before. And before you know it, uh, Frank Salerno and Gil Carrillo were lead investigators for a serial killer. In this case, it was a Night Stalker case. So when they when you got approached to do this show, were you hesitant at first? The one on Netflix? Oh, well, I, I'm hesitant about a lot of them. Over the years, I've been approached by several production companies wanting to do stuff. Uh, and, you know, I've turned a lot of people down. Uh, in this case, it started out as, as you started out your show or talking to you. Uh, there was a personal friend of mine. I knew his whole family. Uh, he became a deputy himself, then retired due to injuries. Yeah. And writing was a, became a writer uh, for the program Chicago PD. Then he went from Chicago PD. He's working on the Mayans. And he's a writer for the Mayans. Well, he approached me and he wanted to take me out to dinner with him and a co-writer. Because in his opinion, as you stated earlier, there are a lot of shows, but when you look for Latino lead roles, mm -hmm. they're all we're all either thugs, dopers, robbers, killers, uh, no positive role models. Yeah. 
And he wanted to talk to me because he said he thinks there's something there to make a positive role model out of a Latino. Yeah. That started with a friendly dinner that led uh, a year later to a second meeting with the director that directed this documentary, a fine gentleman did this, the documentary. I never saw it until it landed just like everybody else. Wow. See any outtakes. I didn't want to see any of it. Uh, he said, well, this is what I want. I said, don't even tell me what you want to do. I trust you. Yeah. You know, the business I don't. And he put it together. He told a true story, mm -hmm. uh, the way it went. So I wasn't hesitant. Once I got to know him and that, that first meeting, you know, I have to be a judge of character. I mean, he was, we bonded, we became friends. He's a great man. Uh, he did great work on this. Uh, got my wife, uh, to be involved. My wife was really hesitant to have any involvement in this. She's very much of an introvert. Yeah. And I told her, but if you, if you do help me out, dear, this will help wives of other cops out there. Yeah. You know, so it'll be good for them. He did it. He was able to calm her down. She talked and you saw how, how well she did, how, how it came out because it's not acting. It's all just answering his questions. He's doing all the questioning. So I wasn't hesitant at all. And since that time, it, it's just opened up so many doors. I bet. I can't believe uh, I've I heard bet. from people all around the world. I, um, it was, it was really well, well done, well produced, well directed. You guys did amazing, you know, and, um, you know, I, I do have a question since you were the, during the time of the night soccer and I've, I've had conversations with friends, you know, just kind of over the dinner table and we start talking about, kind of the serial killer subject, which is uh, uh, um, something that it seemed to come from the 70s and 80s. I mean, is that something that was just big at the time, so it was all over the news, or was there a bigger influx of that than, say, now? Or, or do these things still happen or just don't make headlines anymore? Are you talking about serial killers in general? Yeah, in general. Oh, I, I don't. You know, uh, you have to understand that to us or to some of us, to me, yeah. let's narrow down to me. Uh, my murder is no different than my, the murder of the guy, you know, we had 90 investigators up in the homicide bureau. Everybody's got their cases. And so nobody up there cared about the Ramirez case, except for me and my partner. And then when we started building a task force, certainly then more people got involved, yeah. but we, I, I never thought about that. I never studied serial killers before. Really? And I, I didn't know, I, I didn't work this one as a major thrust with all this. No, I just knew people. I depended on my partner Salerno. I asked him at one time, is it wrong, you know, to think that I need somebody else to die to look for another clue? You know, wow. I'm, I was deeply entrenched in this thing and I needed to solve it. I was driven. So I had his experience because he had worked on the Hillside Strangler. Uh, case himself but this isn't something we study we don't people don't study serial killers and say okay i've studied serial killers now i want to go to homicide bureau oh. because every murder up there has the potential to turn into a serial killer you wow. don't know you have to do everything you can on every case yeah and then if it is a serial killer the links and the evidence will show up i i don't i don't know how how you did that job for so long. I, 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 I commend you for it. You know, like I, I think I was telling you before I hit record that I'll speak for myself, you know, even though I was in gangs and things like that, I was fascinated by the detective. You know, I remember being with the homeboys and just hanging out and I'm just like, man, I'll never be a cop. I'll never be a cop, but man, it'd be cool to be a detective, <laughs> you know? And I don't know if that came from maybe TV shows we grew up watching. I don't, I don't know. know. Let me, let, let me, I, I don't know, this will probably put your viewers in for a little surprise. Yeah. Uh, I was 17 when a cop took me home and told my parents to get it, to sign for me to get off the streets or I'd end up dead or in prison. And so it was that cop that actually saved my life. Wow. And if not, I'd be out on the corner with the homeboys saying, so what the local me porta poco, the sky is blue. I said, where are you from? <laughs> Donde? You know, yeah. and. And he helped me. He helped me write a paper. I wasn't going to graduate. He helped me write a term paper 
my English at that time was a required subject. And my, I was failing. I was going to be the first one in my family not to graduate. And so the teacher just said, write a term paper and I'll give you a D. So I asked this cop, hey, you're always talking smack. You know, you put us on the cars, you do this, you, you say you want to help us, help me write a paper. And he did. No way. So at 17, I joined the United States Army with my parents signing. And that's what turned my life around. I ended up in Vietnam. Vietnam gave me a new appreciation on life. And I just wanted, I wanted to give back. And one of the ways to give back was I wanted to be a cop, give back what that cop gave to me. And I wanted to go to college because back then I thought I was naive and I thought only white rich people got to go to college and nobody in my family had ever gone to college. What was that a fact though back then? I don't know. That was the mind of a 17 year old kid. Yeah. I, I really don't know because all of my friends were Latinos and not too many of them were going to college. Where, where'd you grow up? Grew up in Pico, Pico Rivera. Okay. I, yeah. I passed through there maybe two months ago. Never been there. I just happened to pass through and I stopped at a coffee shop. It's a, it's a good place. Uh, my daughter, it's, it's changed a lot. Yeah. And my daughter with her two, uh, with her family, uh, two children, they live in the same house that I grew up in. Really? Yeah. They, when my mother passed, uh, she was the last one to pass. Uh, I knew what I had to do and I sold the house to divide the money between my sisters. And my daughter said, dad, I want to buy the house. I'm not married. I don't have a boyfriend, I don't have kids, uh, nothing. But I see my other friends that are married and have children and they're still living in apartments. Mm -hmm. So I want to buy it as an investment. And at some point in time, when I'm ready and I have a family, then I'll move in. Wow. And so that's what she did. And uh, she lives in the very same house on the cul-de-sac that I grew up on. That's so cool. So you, it, you, so you go step in that house and millions of memories. Oh, sure. Sure. <laughs> and, and they're, their fond memories inside my house yeah. and the outside the block it's the block isn't the way it was the the young males that hung out on the corner the the homeboys uh, the guys from the barrio you don't see that anymore yeah. which is a good thing um so you said that you went to vietnam so weren't people being drafted you said you joined up yes i joined up and there was a draft going on at the time you're just like, it's going to happen anyways, or you just, that's what you wanted to do. Well, I wanted to do, I had already lost some friends from oh. high school uh, that had been killed over there. As I said, I was 17 years old. I was young and naive. And he said, you better do this. My parents said, if that's what you want. And I said, yeah, that's what I want. I want to go to Vietnam. I want to, I, I thought then I want to avenge the death of my friends. Yeah. And I want to get in there and mix it up, you know, just like a homeboy would back up his, uh, yeah. his homeboys. That's what I want to do. I want to back up my homeboys there. Of course, when I got there, I learned more about life. And wow. I learned that there are absolutely no winners in war. There are no winners because each side thinks they're doing what they think is right for their own country. Yeah. And both sides lose people. And both sides have crying sad family members and friends back at home uh i'm i wouldn't wish war i wouldn't wish that on anybody but i'm so glad that i got to participate that i got to be there because it turned me into a different person it made me a man yeah cured me and uh i i i was still able to do things i mean uh i was able to help start a an orphanage back there Wow. You know, when you, when you're seeing eight year old, nine year old kids <laughs> having to teach them how to use a weapon to protect their village, it's sad. And so there are many sad memories from that place. There are many fond memories. So I try not to dwell on the sad yeah. and just keep a positive outlook on life and everything has turned out uh, good for me. What, what branch were you in? I was in the army mm -hmm. flew. Uh, I was a crew chief on helicopters, uh, we call them slicks, insert, extract, medevac, 
resupply. We did everything. And when you get in those holes where you got to go down and sometimes they're called them hover holes where you have to get down and go straight down because there's trees all around you. Uh, shots being fired. You're, it's an enemy. It's not uh, very serious work. <laughs> and it's wow. frightening. You don't have time to be frightening. You know, I, I talked with one of my own pilots, one of my old pilots, uh, a few years ago, he had seen me on TV and he reached out and we started talking and he remembered this one, uh, one mission that we were on and we had to extract four soldiers from the ground on hundred foot ropes, big trees in a mountain. And we're in a firefight. Everybody's wow. been, like something like watching some war movie on TV. The guys on the ground are shooting and throwing grenades. We're shooting from the helicopter. And all I could do was hear my pilot saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I had to not only make sure that our blades were clear of any trees, I had to keep him calm because he's flying us out of there. So I'm just telling him, calm down. It's okay. This is a game. They're just throwing softballs at us. You're good. You're good. Keep us going. And we were able to get the people out. Do you, do you ever, do you look back at that and it feels like somebody else's life? I, I look back at it. And, and the, the tragic part of that story is I was the last person to see an American alive. He got, he gave up his, he ended up winning the Congressional Medal of Honor. Yeah. Uh, he gave up his, his seat for one of his South Vietnamese uh, soldiers that was with him on the mission, gave it up. We pulled out and he got killed. He just defended the helicopter and us as much as possible. He stood there by himself as he's surrounded by literally hundreds of North Vietnamese regular soldiers. And so it's, wow. it's sad. It's tragic. But like I said, you don't dwell mm -hmm. on the negative. You, you think of the positive and I still meet with some of the guys that I flew with, uh, annually and I once a week I'm down at the VFW post yeah. having something cold to drink with one of some some of my friends yeah wow man the more you the more you talk the more uh <laughs> the more this this your story fascinates me you know the more proud I am just to have this conversation with you oh thank you you know um you know I myself real quick I um I was 32 years old and I was rest, arrested by the FBI and the DEA uh, caught a RICO under a RICO Act. So I went to federal prison from 2004 to 2010. Gave my life over to the Lord in prison. Haven't looked back since. Pastor of church now. But I will say this is that out of the six years I did, one of those I did in solitary confinement, which was the worst, but the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Because it was there that even though it wasn't in a, in a, in a Vietnam firefight, there's, there's a moment in life where you have to look at yourself and really look at yourself and say, what am I doing? You know, and that completely changed my whole life and the, it changed the, the, the man that I am today. You know, so I know it's way different than what your story is, but there's things in life that we go through that we can't take those back, even though it caused pain or hurt or things like that. It actually shapes the man that we become or the woman, you know, whoever's watching becomes. That was your own war and God bless you for beating it. Yeah. You know, I hope all Vietnamese people don't hate me. And I certainly don't hate all Vietnamese people. And in your life, uh, you turned it around and I hope all your old contacts don't hate you. And I know you don't yeah. hate those people that got you put in there. Yeah. They, they, they actually, my old homeboys at first, they're like, Oh, this guy's running to the Bible. But now when really, really they need something, they come to me for prayer. They come to me for counsel. And, and that's, that's awesome. You know, my thing is, uh, uh, I, I say this, I said, you know, for a lot of years, I gave my life to the homies. I said, but when I got out, the rest of my life belongs to my children and my family. Good for you. You know, I, I, I we, we have between me and my wife, we have three grandchildren and man, life is, is beautiful. I, I don't know why I lived and some of them didn't. You know, but I'm grateful and I'm thankful uh, for the moments that I have with, with family, you know, and, and that's so important, you know. Um, so, so you go from 17 years old, you join the army, and then you, you get out, you go to college, and that's where you become an officer? Is that what happened? 
Yeah, I, I started college. I had three goals in life when I got out of the army. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to become a copy give back. And the third one, which was not so good, uh, the third one was I wanted to hook up with my ex-girlfriend who wrote me a Dear John when I was in Vietnam. She broke my corazón. It was terrible. It was ugly. And I wanted to come back. I wanted revenge. I wanted hey, to those, get... those are the letters inmates get too. Yeah, I, I wanted to... I wanted to get her eaten out of the palm of my hand. And then I wanted to dump her like a bad habit. Like she had done me. I wanted to see her suffer. So how'd that work? How'd that work out? I got out in June of uh, 1970. By September of 1970, I had her eaten out of the palm of my hand. The day after Christmas, boom, we got married. So uh, we just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. Wow. So I guess two out of three of my goals were accomplished, and I'm glad the third one didn't make it. Yeah, right, man. God bless your marriage. Thank you. You know, and uh, wow, that's that's a, a, a another another great thing. You know, so in your in your in your time when you were an officer, was there was there any? Um, did you ever feel anything from other officers at that time? I know times are different now. At that time, did you feel like um, maybe because you were Latino or anything, or did they treat you as a brother also because you were a fellow officer? Or how was how was that? No, I was treated. We're all, you, you know, uh, people see Latinos, people see Blacks, people see Asians. All we see are brothers. We're all cops. We don't look at color. Uh, they didn't treat me any better, any worse than anybody else. You make your own friends. You do what you got to do. Yeah. As long as you're a good cop and you're working with good cops, it, it's all about a brotherhood. They don't care what color or anything you are. I was picked to, uh, I, I worked, uh, I migrated from regular patrol to gangs, working a gang unit, but mm -hmm. I was still in uniform. And I did that for uh, a few months and then I got out. I didn't want to do that anymore. And I went back to, I, they used me as a training officer. So mm -hmm. I was training. They came back to me and asked me to go back to gangs. And I told them I didn't like it. I didn't want to. And they said, why? I said, you don't know how to work gangs. You can't go up and talk to a gang member in uniform mm -hmm. and expect him to just open up and talk to you. You can't relate to that uniform. You need to do it in plain clothes, soften up the image. You're not so hard. And they said, well, that's why we want you back. We want you to head up the, and we started a plainclothes gang unit. So it was very successful. I worked gangs, uh, was very successful. I could relate to the guys. I was a natural. Uh, my partner, when I started that, uh, one of the best patrol partners I ever had, uh, it was, they used to call me in the streets. Uh, I was the Kukui and he was green eyes. We had, we had nicknames just like everybody else. And he was right there from the barrio. He was from the, from the neighborhood. He was a big hearted guy. Yeah. And, uh, that we matched well, we did good. Everything went well. They then uh, started a headquarters gang unit. So that meant I was going from regular patrol to now becoming a gang investigator, uh, and filing cases and talking to people, gathering intelligence. Yeah. And that just led a natural shoe in. Then I was asked, uh, if I was, ready if i wanted to go to homicide and that was my dream yeah. uh homicide detectives were creme de la creme oh yeah were good when they walked up everybody got out of their way <laughs> everybody busted their booty to help them out and solve the case and now they were asking for me i was the youngest guy to go up there and i was the youngest guy probably for about the first six seven years that i was there uh it takes an average of 15 years to get there i got there in nine and a half and so, that, they asked me. So your approach when you were in gangs, um, well, one thing, I, I, so so people in the neighborhood do give you nicknames, like in the movie Colors, what they call them Pac-Man? Sure. So, sure. Okay, so, um, so I imagine that when you were working gangs, your perspective of the barrio was way different than, you know, somebody else. Sure, it was. It was different for most Latinos working, or if you were in a South Central, if you were Black, it'd be different for you than it would for other people, because we understand cultural differences, Yeah. or some people don't. Something very simple. If 
a non-Spanish speaking officer is talking to a Spanish speaking individual and you say, do you understand what I'm telling you right now? And that person says, yes. Well, I know that person didn't understand anything this guy was talking about or, or it was broken in there. But that Latino was too proud to admit he wasn't smart enough or didn't have the intelligence to understand his English. Yeah. So they just say yes, no, and they really don't understand. So what that allowed me to do is talk to people and understand whether it be gang colloquialism, being able to speak from the bottom of the street yeah. talk or speak proper Spanish or just speak English. Mm -hmm. Whereas somebody that didn't have that cultural background It'd be a little more difficult for them yeah wow wow so um you know oh another thing i know there's so many things there's another thing that i know you brought up is kind of off topic but you actually met the real teacher that edward james almost played in stand and deliver yes hi miss galante tell me about that well i madam he would <laughs> when i tell you you're gonna be shocked there happened to be a local bar by the high school, by the sheriff's station we worked at, and we'd go have a cold one. Uh, I mean, some teachers from Garfield would go there to drink mm -hmm. on one side of the bar, and some cops would go sit on the other side of the bar. Everybody was friendly. That's just the way uh, they had pool tables on one side. The other side, they had a shuffleboard table and just some uh, tables to sit at. So. He'd be in there and we'd buy one side, we'd buy the other. We'd just talk and BS, go over there and talk to them, talk over here, send drinks back and forth. Uh, just a friendly, yeah, just a friendly patron of the establishment, kind of like cheers. And the where's Telephone. Garfield High at? Uh, um, it's in it's in the unincorporated area of East Los, of, uh, Los Angeles. Okay. It is about eight miles east of downtown LA. Okay. That's where the high school's at. Yeah. So, so you were at this bar. Yes. And is that where you met him, or what happened? How did well, that... that? We're just in there together. It's just like I said in that program, Cheers. Yeah. Where everybody's in there, everybody knows your name. Hey, how you doing? What's going? That's how you meet him. You say hello. And I mean, we weren't bosom buddies. I didn't know about his life. I didn't yeah. know that he was doing all this calculus teaching. I just know he's a friendly man teaching at Garfield High School, a patron what, of the establishment that I used to go to. So what, what did you think What did me. you think when that movie came out? That's one of my favorite movies ever. I still, I, I've seen it at least a dozen times. Yeah. And I still get teary-eyed in the end. Yeah. It's, it's, I know, it was I know well what's going to happen. I know it's true. And I still cry. Because wow. the underdog, the Latino, he comes out victorious. And you know, I remember when that movie came out, it was so opposite anything that had to do with Latinos in movies. And yeah, you know, it, it was just great. And I'll, and I'll tell you, it's not just because it's a Latino movie. Yeah. Because there's another movie, Stand By Me, yeah. that's based on a true story. And I get teary-eyed over that one. Yeah. And it's all African-American people. They're all Blacks. Yeah. So it's not has nothing to do with race. Mm -hmm. It's about humanity and people. Yeah, uh, I was asked at one time because I used to play uh, every year. I've been in parades. I've been to schools, a Santa Claus. And I got contacted by a reporter doing an article on Santa Clauses of color. What was it like to be a Santa Claus of color? Hmm. And it kind of upset me. And I explained to her, you have to understand something. Writers and adults see color kids don't see color kids see santa claus yeah and that's all that matters so i have no opinion uh nor do i care to ask your <laughs> answer your question about santa claus of color yeah so wow. there is no color uh in my eyes there are people and i don't care who you are you're good you're good you're bad be careful you know and and, and I, I find that's cool that you say that having I mean, you just mentioned going to Vietnam, which I, I imagine, maybe correct me, but when people are shooting at you, you, you don't pay attention to what somebody's race is. They are 
So I imagine that's what carried off into being a police officer is that these are your brothers. You know, they're watching your back, you're watching their back and you want to come home. Uh, exactly. I couldn't state it any better. Uh, when I went to Vietnam, the first guy in my helicopter that got shot, my gunner, he got shot in the back. He was black. I came back from Vietnam in 1969 and I was sent straight to uh, Georgia. Yeah. Fort Stewart, Georgia. And at that time in 1969, they still had segregation. Oh, wow. So you'd go off base and you'd see signs, whites only, coloreds only, blacks only. And I'm looking at my skin. I'm saying, where do I go? So I, I didn't go off base. I stood on base and I hated it Yeah. because I'm saying, why can this black man go over there and take a bullet for me and do everything for everybody in the United States, but yet he can't come out here and uh, break bread with me. Mm -hmm. And I was so upset because that's not the way I was brought up. That's not the way LA was at the time. My next door neighbors, when I was a kid, were blacks and loved me just as much as my parents. I can still, I'm 71 years old and I can still remember Gertrude Jones. Yeah. And she loved me. Well, now that can't happen over there. I was so upset. I signed waivers. I said, send me back to Vietnam. I'd rather be back there fighting than being over here like this yeah wow so that's just the way it is yeah so if if somebody is watching this now there's a lot of people that feel that they can't they can't rise above they can't further themselves they they can't they it's almost a um i like to call it a, a poverty mentality you know they feel that they can't because maybe nobody in their family has ever done it but you you, sir, are a living example of that. That I, you, can, I, you can have goals and go for it. You, you can do, uh, in the words of Jaime Escalante, con ganas, with ganas, which is translated to with desire, mm -hmm. you can accomplish anything you want. I don't care if you're dirt poor. I don't care if you're a hardcore gang member. You can do anything you want. You, my friend, are just as much living proof as I am. You've made it. You out. You came from the bottom. You got out of the bottom. You went through. You went through some hard times and purgatory over there. Yeah. But you're back, and now you've got a family. You've got a life. You believe in the Lord. You have faith. Uh, now you're doing this. Anybody out there can do the same thing. They just can't feel sorry for themselves, and they can't blame anybody else for what they're going through. Yeah. Everything has to start within themselves. I have a um, I have a, a girl cousin and uh, my aunt. She passed away. She's with the Lord now. But they, she raised my cousins in the projects in Modesto, on the outskirts of Modesto. And these projects, there's one way in, one way out. I remember my my male cousin. We used to. He belonged to a gang there, so they kind of accepted me when I would visit. But my girl cousin, she was younger than my cousin, um, than my the male cousin. I was always around. She was just a little girl playing around all the time, but she grew up in those projects. My aunt worked a cannery, could never hardly speak English all her life, worked as a cannery worker. And um, my young cousin, she swore she would get my aunt out of there someday. And even though my aunt passed away, my cousin was able to work at KFC that was around the block, get herself through law, law school, became a lawyer and fought against the biggest, um, uh, what do they call the lawyer? Uh, uh, when there's a bunch of lawyers, it's a, um, a firm, a firm, a law firm. She fought on the side where she was representing people and she was ripping this law firm up. This young Latina from the projects with the mom that worked in the cannery to the point where they offered her a job. The only reason she eventually took it was because she wanted to get my aunt out of the projects and she was sick and she would promise her, I'm going to get you a house. I'm going to get you a house. She was able to accomplish that before my aunt passed away, bought a house, moved her out of the projects, 
you know, and became one of the strongest lawyers in that entire firm, a young girl that grew up in the project, you know, and I, I'm just like, there's no excuse for anybody in that neighborhood. Then if my cousin mate did that, it was because she had, like you said, ganas. That's right. And I'm, I'm so proud of her, you know, and it just, should be. Yeah. And, and, and every time you hear, unfortunately, we just don't hear a lot of stories like that. And I have no idea why, you know, I worked with, uh, I, I was just yesterday in uh, computer conversation, we were texting back and forth, a gentleman by the name of Philip Rodriguez, UCLA graduate, and he did a uh, documentary on Ruben Salazar. And I worked with him. Mm. And it started out, he thought, he thought he was making a documentary about a martyr. And after we were done, he realized that it wasn't about martyrdom. It was a man caught in the middle there. And yeah. there was, it was a beautiful thing. And, and he can do anything. And, and, and when we're talking about why don't we hear many of these stories? Well, maybe because we were not just like my friend approached me. We were not in a position of power. We were not in financial uh, people in, the high finance world, we're yeah. not listening. Now the demographics are changing and times are changing, maybe, and hopefully we'll be hearing more and more stories such as your cousin. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, wow, man. I just wanna, um, again, I'm so glad we finally met. I'm glad and I'm excited. And uh, I'm excited to put this up on the channel. I think it's gonna be inspiring to a lot of people. I think it's interesting. It, it's fascinating. I mean, and, um, you know, do you taking the time? So let me say this though. I forgot where, now that you're retired, what are you doing now? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing speaking engagements. Uh, I do a lot of zoom stuff. Uh, but I was in Austin in June, uh, at a conference, they called it crime con, just like they have this comic con. These yeah. are for followers of true crime. Uh, because of COVID, they only had about 1,500 people where they normally would have expected at least 3,000 uh, people, but it was a great, uh, great experience. I'll be going uh, next week. I'll be going to Dallas to do some speaking. I'll be in Atlanta, Georgia, which is no longer segregated in October, <laughs> and uh, doing speaking engagements. Uh, of course, my I'm, I'm having more fun uh, I'm doing the George Lopez, Oh My God, Hi podcast, which is can be on YouTube. I started with him on session uh, 11, and I've done 10 of them with him now. Now I'm just, now it's every week. And, and he's put my picture on his billboard, yeah. uh, my picture, my caricature with his, and the George Lopez, Oh My God, uh, billboard. Last week was up in Times Square in lights. And I mean, for the local Latino to make Times Square, that was a big thing. <laughs> how, 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 that's kind of random. How did you meet George Lopez? George Lopez watched the documentary and one of my buddies called me up and said, hey, did anybody contact you? I said, what do you, what do you mean? What do you, why would somebody get to contact me? He said, well, hey, I just heard on the radio right now, George Lopez saying anybody know Gil Carrillo, have him get in touch with me and then put out the number. Wow. So that's how I met him. The first time I talked with him on the phone, we must have talked for 35, 45 minutes. And it was a very nice, pleasant conversation. Yeah. Not about business. I didn't even know he was doing a podcast. Yeah, and, I, I didn't I didn't know until you mentioned it. And he said, why don't you come on down and uh, hang out, just visit with us. So I had no idea. So I went down to the, gave me the address. I went, it's a studio. And I went in there. And next thing I know, I'm sitting there as part of his podcast. And he had Bobby Lee, another comedian who used to be on Mad TV. Yeah, yeah. Funny, funny man. And uh, we were talking about the Night Stalker case and talking wow. about my relationship with my dad. And uh, Bobby Lee actually started crying. You know, it was so he was very emotional over the relationship because he didn't have such a good relationship. Yeah, I think I know who Bobby Lee is. He's a comedian, right? Yes. Yeah, I know. And, and that's what started it uh, all out. And I've done uh, several of them now. Yeah. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a regular. 
<laughs> uh, tomorrow we'll be doing one with, uh, I guess tomorrow is going to be Anna Rivera, who's a CNN analyst, reporter. Yeah. Uh, she's been, she was a regular on The View, the ladies talk show. Yeah. We've done stuff with George before. So she's uh, going to come down to the studio with us tomorrow. And I understand uh, we may be having uh, Oscar de la Hoya pretty soon. Wow. So I, I, got, I got two questions about George Lopez. Yes. One is, is, is he the same off, off screen? And second, is his head really that big? <laughs> <laughs> I, you, you know, I'm never a guy that looks at the negative. I'm always a man that picks the positive. My glass is always half full. George, I, I explained to him uh, not too long ago, I was at his house and I explained to him that his persona was that of a, a vato loco from the, from the barrio. And he's always talking like that. And he's a yeah. good cat. Uh, but in getting to know him the way I have, he's a very personable, very intelligent, very business man yeah. and has a soft, great big heart that people don't see. Wow. And he talks about it openly. Uh, he still goes to counseling. Uh, and, he, and he told me, he says, you know, hey, a lot, of, a lot of comedians have problems that they grew up with when they were younger. And he still goes for counseling. Wow. He's a wonderful man. He's taken a liking to myself. He's taken a liking to my family. One of the comedians, a guy named Momo Rodriguez, uh, I went to go see Momo. And Momo's telling my, my daughter, and he just told me, he says, you have no idea how much George loves your dad. He says, he really does. He says, and George don't like too many people, <laughs> says, but he really likes your dad. And, and uh, I, like I said, I'm, I'm 71 years old. I'm having the time of my life. I've met a new friend. Uh, I love the man and, and we get along good. It's, it's, and it's so much fun. If you ever watch it, all you ever do is see me laughing on the show. <laughs> I told him the other day, it kind of reminded me of uh, Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon. He's the yeah. Johnny and I'm the Ed McMahon on the show. Yeah, because you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I did look for it when you told me. I haven't watched one yet, but I'm going to. But I, one thing that, and maybe it'll make more sense if I, when I watch it. But I'm like, what's a comedian? And he's sitting there with the homicide detective. You know, I'm, I'm curious to see what that, what that looks like. He's always, trust me, he's always funny. On the air, off the air. He's always yeah. funny. He's just like anybody else from the neighborhood. You know, he's always got something wise to say. He's, a, yeah. he's very quick-witted, very sharp. To, and, and I just can't believe his life's experience, everything that he's gone through, yeah. business-wise and travel-wise. I mean, he's showing me a picture. He, he was very down in the dumps uh, Monday. He was sad. And he was sad because it was the anniversary of uh, Kobe, uh, Kobe Bryant's death. Yeah. And we were, maybe it was Tuesday we were down there. We had to change it to Tuesday. But anyway, he was sad and he's just kind of down trying to get back up. And he showed me a picture of a Christmas party at his house a couple of years ago. And Kobe Bryant was at his house. Wow. You know, George has been to the White House. He's been all, you know, there's just so much that people don't know about him. And he's, and he's got, uh, if you watch that podcast, we're drinking a beer. Yeah, it's George Lopez beer. He's got George Lopez tacos. He's got Mas Chingon restaurants. <laughs> you know, he's he's into everything. He's getting ready to do another uh, sitcom starting in October. I think they're gonna start shooting in October. Yeah, so he it, it's wow it's business. I don't know how he uh, manages everything. How he does it? Certainly, he has a team. Yeah, uh, of course. But, uh, yeah. I know he's got time for me and i'm grateful he's a great man great that's event. awesome man that, that's awesome that that's what you're that all the things that you're doing um you know hopefully in the future i mean seeing that netflix uh special i was like man i wonder if they're ever gonna make a a night soccer movie that'd be cool well they're, they're i'm not gonna say they are or they're not yeah uh i know they've just extended uh my contract with them mm. by six months uh so that means that they want to hold on to me to do something. Uh, so they're holding on for a while. And yeah. we'll see how that goes. Uh, one of the guests on uh, the George Lowe's Oh My God uh, podcast was a guy named Ben Hernandez. 
Uh, I got, I, I apologize to him. I can't remember his last name. It's Ben Hernandez Bear. Or mm -hmm. I, I apologize to him greatly. He is a Latino, but he's the only local Latino because most directors, producers, even though they're out here, they're from Mexico. Yeah. This guy started out as a stuntman in the business uh, a long time ago. And now he's into directing wow. and producing. And I know when I was talking to somebody from the people that produced the documentary, they said, well, what's his name? And I gave it to him. He says, let's see if he's legit, you know, and they ran it. Yeah. He says, oh yeah, he's directed some TV and everything. He was excited. He's seen the documentary several times and he's asked me uh, if he could make a story about my life. Wow, so, I mean. There, there's something. It, it, it would be if it happens the, the way I look at life now if it happens it happens yeah uh, this documentary all I've ever wanted to do is leave a legacy for my children and my grandchildren mm -hmm. the documentary accomplished that in my bucket list anything that happens now is above and beyond I'm grateful and it didn't happen as a result of me it happened as a result of all those that surround me yeah especially my family wow you know, I, I just want to thank you for your time. I, I want to thank you for your story, for everything that has happened in your life. God has has blessed you. And, you know, my prayers that God continues to bless you and watch over you and, and over your family and your grandchildren, you know, and um, you're, you're right. It is, it is a legacy. And I'm glad I was able to share it to those that watch my channel, you know, um, it's, it's a small channel. It's not a big channel. We, we're almost hitting 10,000 subscribers. So I'm really excited about that, you know, and, um, but, you know, and for it being a, a Christian religious, you know, channel, that, that's pretty good. You know, that's pretty good. Almost hitting 10,000. So we're, we're doing good. We're doing, you know, great on our end over here. We're going to continue to serve our community and do whatever it is we can for the people around us. And, you know, um, and I think ultimately that's what we all did. When you, as a detective, it was your way of serving the community. Me as a, as a pastor, it's a way to serve my community and those that are around me, you know? And, um, you know, I'm glad that, that our paths crossed. I'm glad you, you actually um, um, replied, you know, to my message. I appreciate it. I hopefully this isn't the last time I talk to you, you know, and I'll be looking forward to the podcast you do and future things that you do you know and um just i just want to thank you well it, it, believe me it is my pleasure i hope you keep in touch i hope uh some of the homeboys that are out there looking for help and by the fact by the mere fact if they're paying attention or watching or listening to your podcast yeah. that means they're on the fence they're looking for help yeah and i hope uh this overweight retired cop just helps push them on the right side and yeah uh i'm here for them as much as i am for anybody i've got to give back what was given to me and i'll continue to do that yeah. until my time on this earth is over and begins up and uh hopefully up with the lord you know, yeah. I, that i do yeah all right man let me stop this recording god bless you guys thank you so much where's the pause all right guys see you later